The following program is a dramatic reenactment. Certain events have been altered and names have been changed. The story you're about to see is based upon first-hand accounts of the actual events. In Bosnia, indicted Serb war criminals walk free. Their crimes, the deadliest since World War II, remain unpunished. The international community demands justice. The U.S. Navy SEALs and British SAS team up to capture three men charged with genocide. In 1961, an elite team of special forces was created for covert operations on the sea, air, and land. Their missions have been kept secret for national security reasons. Who they are and what they do has remained shrouded in secrecy. Now, based on first-hand accounts of classified operations, these are the untold stories of the Navy SEALs. Bosnia, 1992. Bosnian Serbs embarked on a campaign of ethnic cleansing. They targeted their non-Serb neighbors of Muslim and Croat descent. Simo Diriaca was the chief of police. As a Serb official, he was determined to eliminate any threat to Serb rule in Bosnia. As a businessman, he allegedly made enormous profits selling the homes of his victims. He was not alone. Serb officials formed paramilitary squads all over Bosnia to rid the country of non-Serbs. Twenty-five thousand terrified Muslims and Croats fled their homes in the wake of the violence. The United Nations established a safe haven for the refugees in Srebrenica. Dutch troops were deployed to guard them. It was not enough. Serb forces easily overran the enclave. Serb soldiers loaded thousands of Muslims and Croats onto buses. Some would be sent to refugee camps. Some would never be seen again. British journalists smuggled out images of a refugee camp at Omarska. To the world, they were a painful reminder of Nazi atrocities in World War II. Slobodan Milosevic, the president of Serbia, hid behind a tapestry of lies and denial. In 1995, NATO used airstrikes to broker an end to hostilities in Bosnia. Within months, the Dayton Accords achieved an uneasy peace but suspicions soon arose about the fate of the rest of Bosnia's non-Serb population. Satellite imagery confirmed NATO's worst fears. They spotted areas in the Bosnian countryside that appeared to be mass graves. Teams of NATO experts were sent into Bosnia to conduct a more thorough investigation. The Serbs had taken steps to hide the bodies of their victims. But evidence of their atrocities remained.
as Muslims and Croats mourned the loss of their loved ones. They were asked to identify their murderers. Now the accusations became personal. Men like Simo Diriacha were no longer anonymous. As the search expanded, the body count grew. Mass graves were unearthed all over the country. The world community demanded justice. The International Criminal Tribunal ordered the Serbs to hand over a number of suspected war criminals. The Serb government refused. If The Hague wanted to bring former Bosnian soldiers to trial, they'd have to catch them first. NATO planned and launched Operation Tango. A team of British SAS commandos was deployed to Bosnia. They carried with them secret warrants for the arrest of Serb soldiers accused of war crimes. On March 14, 1997, a team of SAS commandos spotted Simo Diriaca in Prigidor, a Serb stronghold in Bosnia. But the target had surrounded himself with heavily armed bodyguards. This level of security was unusual for Diriaca. It was as if he knew they were coming. Target head. Abort mission. I repeat. Abort mission. Turn to base. Hello? Put me through to operations. Communications between the SAS and the Hague were being monitored by Serb militants. Okay. Advance warning of the SAS plan had been sent directly to their targets. Now forewarned, the accused war criminals had taken extreme measures to protect themselves from capture. As long as they remained free, the rule of law held no meaning in Bosnia. On July 9, 1997, world leaders convened in Madrid to discuss the problem. The summit produced a clear mandate to arrest people who have been accused of war crimes and turn them over for trial. This was more than a call to action. It was a promise to the civilized world. England and the United States fielded a team of their finest commandos, the British SAS and the U.S. Navy SEALs. Inserting the teams into the country would be difficult. The U.S. Air Base in Tuzla was located 50 kilometers from the Serbian border. Serb spies kept the airfield under constant surveillance. They were looking for anything that suggested the arrival of American commandos. The SEALs slipped into Tuzla undetected. They used a modern day Trojan horse. Welcome to Bosnia, gentlemen. Tuzla Air Base was located in the American controlled sector of eastern Bosnia. It would house the mission's base of operations. Commander Michael Lowry would run the operation from Tuzla. 
Lieutenant Commander Mike Dillon and British SAS Major Hugh Whitman would lead the team in the field. Commander Lowry. Good morning. Good morning. Together, they would plan a series of missions to capture three men accused of crimes against humanity. Sir. Bring it in, gentlemen. Listen up. The commander briefed the SEALs and the British SAS on the targets. Gentlemen, meet the bad guys. Simeo Turlaka, age 49. Head of the secret police in Priador. Officially, Diriacha had helped run the concentration camps at Omarska and Kiraturm. Unofficially, he ran a gang that sold off the homes of dead refugees. Milan Kovacevic, age 57. This guy was a doctor and the former deputy mayor of Priador. He oversaw the operations of the camps where refugees were tortured and executed. Like Diriacha, Kovacevic was a corrupt official who used his position to make money. He specialized in taking over the businesses of non-Serbs who had been murdered at Omarska. And last, but certainly not least, General Radislav Kristic. The first two guys are basically thugs, but Kristic is a prime target. As commander of Bosnia's 5th Corps, Kristic was personally responsible for the massacre of 10,000 refugees at Srebrenica. He had been accused of the worst atrocities since World War II. Before the commandos could arrest them, they would have to track them down. Surveillance would be tricky. To limit the risk of discovery, the SEALs had a secret weapon. An unmanned aerial vehicle, or UAV. This remote-controlled plane had been developed to provide mobile surveillance without detection. The UAV was small enough to avoid radar, but carried powerful digital cameras that could downlink real-time video anywhere in the world. It would serve as the team's eye in the sky. Okay, gentlemen, listen up. Our mission is to provide communications and surveillance support for the British 22 SAS. We will jointly and covertly infiltrate the Praetor region of northern Bosnia to capture three persons indicted for war crimes. The team would travel via truck convoy from Tuzla, 120 miles northwest to Prigidor. The Serbs had an established network of spies, and the country was teeming with gunmen. If the commandos were stopped, it would be dealt with decisively. Be a second Commander Dillon emphasized the need for stealth. We're not here to leave small footprints, gentlemen. We're here to leave no footprints whatsoever. From this point on, we are ghosts, gentlemen. Under cover of night, a team of U.S. Navy SEALs traveled from Tuzla Air Base to a remote location deep inside Bosnia. They kept to the back roads to avoid Serb checkpoints. Their destination, a safe house outside the city of Prigidor. Their mission, to capture three Bosnian war criminals. The safe house was their forward command post in country. Its proximity to the targets made it an ideal staging area for the covert operation. The SEALs were met by the British SAS under the command of Major Hugh Whitman. Between the SEALs and the SAS, the team had an unparalleled level of technology and special training at their disposal. Surveillance and tactical missions would be launched from the safe house. But these operations would also be monitored over 100 miles away in Tuzla. Two control centers would use laptop computers to relay real-time video images via satellite. This would aid in communications and mission planning. 
B squad. Sir. Take the watch. The rest of you listen up. <clears throat> their first priority was to get their surveillance equipment online. We're running as soon as we can. We're gonna need both fixed post and moving surveillance. We got about two positions. Solid intelligence, the key to any mission, was critical here. The SEALs had to find out where the three war criminals were most vulnerable to capture. First priority of business is get the surveillance communications equipment up and running. Aye, sir. Whatever help he needs. On a spring morning in 1997, Kovacevic left his house for work. The mobile ground unit watched his every move. They turned surveillance duties over to the UAV unit once the target left the area. As Kovacevic's car sped away, an unmanned aerial vehicle was launched from Tuzla. Acquiring visual. Its high resolution video cameras came online immediately. Pressure 2 2 airborne at 1906 Zulu. All systems were green as the UAV sped towards Prigidor. The images were relayed to Tuzla and the safe house simultaneously. Once in position, the safe house assumed control of the plane. They used the UAV's powerful cameras to sweep the city's access roads. They had to reacquire the target quickly. Roger, uplink to manual control. The UAV picked up Kovacevic's black sedan on a road leading into Prigidor. Roger that. Its cameras tracked the suspect's route to work and fed the images to Tuzla and the safe house. A mobile ground unit was on the move before Kovacevic even arrived at his destination, Prigidor Hospital. They were waiting when he got there. B squad, we have the target. Hunter 2 2 can return to base. Roger, watchdog. Hunter 2 2 returning to base. Kovacevic's bodyguards accompanied him only as far as the entrance. This information would be useful when it came time to capture him. The surveillance team remained outside the hospital while Kovacevic went about his daily business. A man accused of mass murder was now working as a hospital administrator. Milan Kovacevic, what do you want? Here, let's go. Let's see what we're going to do with this guy. Commander Dillon and Major Whitman reviewed their course of action. Kovacevic was only vulnerable inside the hospital. His guards stayed outside. It would be difficult, but they could work around the bodyguards. Simo Diriaccia showed no such vulnerability. Days went by as the SEALs followed his routine, watched his habits, and learned to anticipate his behavior. One thing never varied. The presence of the heavily armed gunmen protecting Diriacha. The UAV finally revealed his one vulnerability. He liked to fish. The tiny plane followed Diriaccia to his fishing cabin. It was located in the mountains 50 miles outside the city of Pale. He had traveled to the remote destination with only one other person, his teenage son. Yes, 
Yeah, I'm off. Eat for the hole. By Bosnian standards, Diriacha lived a life of luxury. Luxury that had been paid for with blood money. Now a team of dedicated men intended to find justice for his victims. Images of Diriacha's activities were transmitted in real time to both the safe house and the SEAL base in Tuzla. Commander Lowry was alerted. He considered the possibilities. With the lake at his back, the target would have nowhere to run. On-site recon revealed that a single road led in and out of the area. The isolated cabin was the commando's best chance to capture the accused war criminal. The surveillance was now complete. The commandos would move on the two targets separately, simultaneously, and with extreme aggression. It would be the first time Western allies would use force to capture a war criminal. In the early morning hours of July 10, 1997, a joint team of U.S. Navy SEALs and British SAS commandos launched a two-pronged operation. Their mission, to seize two Serb officials charged with crimes against humanity. Their targets were 100 miles apart. They would have to capture them silently and simultaneously. The team would then rendezvous with a helicopter for extraction to the U.S. Air Base. All of this would have to happen in a matter of hours. The team left the safe house just before dawn. B Squad went after Kovacevic. The commandos headed towards Brigidor in a convoy of three vehicles. A van would be used to transport the prisoner. A chase car would provide backup. The third vehicle was hidden a few kilometers from a Serb checkpoint. Commandos carried forged papers that identified them as members of an international medical association. They hoped it was enough to get them past the Serb checkpoint leading into Prigidor. Checkpoint crossings were routine, especially for international aid units delivering medical supplies. Today, the guards seemed alert, on edge. The SEALs were under direct orders not to engage local forces, but they would defend themselves if they had to. was on schedule. 
they would make it to Prigidor Hospital at precisely 9 a.m. Minutes after the convoy cleared the barricade, Simo de Riacha and his son left their cabin and headed for the lake. They were joined by Deriacha's brother-in-law. As in past visits to the cabin, there was no sign of Deriacha's bodyguards. The isolation of the property had lulled him into a false sense of security. The commandos intended to use that isolation to their own advantage. A squad had driven back roads to the property at dawn. position 100 yards from the shore. As anticipated, Deriacha pulled away from the dock a few minutes after eight. At exactly 9 a.m., B squad arrived at Brigidor Hospital. Copy, Bravo Squad. Stand by. A Squad was ordered to close in on the lake. in position. Roger, Alpha. Stand by. Both squads were now in position, awaiting the go-ahead from Tuzla. Alpha, bravo. This is Tango 1. You have a green light. I repeat, a green light. At exactly 9.20, B squad prepared to enter the hospital. hospital receptionist refused them entrance. She told them to leave the medical supplies at the front desk. Petty Officer Jack Navari explained that he needed Kovacevic to sign for the supplies personally. Still, she refused. 
Navari knew they couldn't force their way in. Not with Kovacevic's bodyguards so close at hand. But they were running out of time. At the lake, surveillance had proven correct. Diriacha was an impatient fisherman. Once he reached the dock, he would have nowhere to run. A joint squad of Navy SEALs and British SAS commandos had cornered an accused war criminal at his fishing cabin in Bosnia. But Simo Diriaccia had no intention of surrendering peacefully. Dylan called in helicopters to extract the team to transport Dariach's body to Tuzla. One friendly wounded. The first half of the mission had not gone according to plan. Unaware of the events at the lake, B Squad was already inside the hospital. Imamo, medicine is Dr. Kovacevic. Kovacevic's guards lingered in the lobby just a few feet away. The seals were out of time. Navari had no choice. He bluffed. Navari told the receptionist he would take the penicillin elsewhere. If Kovacevic could not sign for the shipment personally, they would deliver it to another hospital. She finally relented. The team moved quickly to the east wing of the hospital. They had only minutes to grab Kovacevic. The extraction van would arrive at exactly 9.33. Once inside the administrator's office, the capture went down like clockwork. There would be no shootouts on this mission. But the team had to get him out of the building fast, before someone noticed he was missing. Kovacevic's men in the lobby, they would need to find a new exit. This way. 
There was a loading dock at the rear of the hospital. The convoy would take back roads out of Brigidor. The vehicles used in the snatch were abandoned. Even with Kovacevic safely out of the city, they could take no chances. Kovacevic was transferred and driven to a remote clearing in the woods. He would then be flown by a helicopter to Tuzla and from there to The Hague. The SEALs and the British SAS had put the Serbian government on notice. War crimes would not go unpunished. Now the team faced its biggest challenge. Go! Capturing one of Bosnia's most notorious and well-protected war criminals. Halt! Stop right there! In 1997, the US Navy SEALs and British SAS had taken down two alleged Serb war criminals. Simo Diriaccio, a former police chief, chose death for capture. Milan Kovacevic was taken alive. He was flown to the Netherlands to stay in trial for his crimes. In November 1998, a NATO courier arrived at a CIA safe house near Prigidor, Bosnia. He carried with him a secret indictment issued by the International Criminal Tribunal at The Hague. Commander Mike Dillon and his team had been ordered to go after the most powerful Serb official to date. General? Lieutenant General Radislav Kristic. Kristic was accused of leading an attack on the UN safe haven at Srebrenica where 25,000 Muslim refugees had sought sanctuary from the war in Bosnia. Under the command of Kristic and his military chief, General Ratko Mladic, Bosnian Serbs rounded up thousands of refugees. Reports described how more than 60 busloads of refugees were taken from the UN safe haven to execution sites in the country. There, the refugees were ordered to dig their own graves. Then, they were systematically murdered. Diriacha and Kovacevic had been motivated by greed and racism. Kristic was a deadly professional with a pension for cruelty. A week after the murders at Srebrenica, Kristic was promoted for his efficiency. But to non-Serbs, it was the worst atrocity of the war. Kristic was a critical NATO target. His arrest would establish an important precedent. In cases of genocide, 
The men who give the orders are just as guilty as the men who pull the triggers. Once again, the UAV was called into action. The commandos would use both aerial and fixed post surveillance to watch the target's movements. Diriacha's death and Kovacevic's arrest made Kristic wary. Armed guards patrolled the perimeter. The general had taken drastic steps to protect himself, and those were just the security measures they could see. Intelligence indicated that some Serb fugitives slept with their guns and planted landmines in their front yards. Dog handler, guard gate number two. Слушай, Пет, за 15 минут кречемо. Fixed post surveillance of the residents was uplinked to both command and control centers. All right, adjust the antenna. Take a peek at this. Keep going. Keep going. Kristich's residence was oh, located right, stop, stop. at an intersection. The building had at least a dozen potential escape routes. Christie's home was too secure. Surveillance revealed Christie's was far more vulnerable when he traveled. He made regular business trips to Banja Luka, a city an hour southeast of Prijedor. was usually accompanied by a single driver. If the team was successful, December 2nd, 1998 would be the general's last trip. The most direct route to Banja Luka took Kristic and his driver through the American-controlled sector of Bosnia. They had been through this checkpoint many times and had never encountered a problem. This time would be different. A team of highly trained commandos was waiting for him. Oni insistiraju. Vozi dalje, to je naređenje. Go, 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 go
target fast and hard. Kristich and his driver were too stunned to resist. They were extracted from the vehicle in a matter of seconds. The capture had been flawless. He is yours! This one is ours! What is it? But now the team had to get their prisoner out of the country. A Serb controlled checkpoint stood between the team and their extraction point. The fate of the mission would depend on the next few minutes. The commandos stowed their weapons as they approached the checkpoint. escaped without bloodshed. It was now only a few short miles to the rendezvous point. A NATO helicopter was waiting to airlift them to Tuzla. From there, General Christich had a one-way ticket to The Hague. On March 13, 2000, the trial of Radislav Christich commenced at The Hague. In his opening statement, Prosecutor Mark Harmon called the case a triumph of good over evil. He condemned men like Kristich, men who participated in genocide or stood silently in the face of it. Despite his crimes, Simo Diriacha's death outraged the Serb community. They claimed NATO overstepped its mandate by actively pursuing war criminals. Milan Kovacevic would never return to the homeland he terrorized. He died of a heart attack in prison. On August 2, 2001, General Radislav Kristić was found guilty of genocide. He was sentenced to 46 years in prison. He was the first person to be convicted of genocide by the International Criminal Tribunal. On June 29, 2001, Serb authorities turned President Slobodan Milosevic over to The Hague. He is charged with war crimes and crimes against humanity. <laughs> 